Okay, so thank you all for joining me tonight. This is one of three presentations that I'll actually be hosting uh, this month for Women's History, well, Women's History Month, which is, which is the month of March every single year. And, you know, for those of you who don't know me, uh, my name is Shantae Moore. I'm a How Money Works educator. Uh, by profession, I guess you could call myself like a financial advisor. And I've been doing this for over 16 years. I've been in the financial industry uh, rather for 16 years. And I've learned a lot. I've seen, um, you know, when when you, as you, you know, for, with me doing this for such a long time, I work with so many families one-on-one. -on -one, and this is a conversation that's typically not talked about. Um, when we talk about domestic violence and financial abuse. Hey, Peaches. Um, I, you know, even for myself, you know, I hate to admit that I'm part of that statistic. I, I really don't, have never really shared publicly that, you know, I have been a, a victim of domestic violence and past relationships, you know, unfortunately in more than one relationship. Um, my personal first experience with domestic violence was at the age of 17 with um, someone that I thought I really loved at the time. And, um, you know, it's, it's crazy. Like, as I go through this presentation and read these statistics, like what 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 this really looks like. It, this is a very real reality for a lot of women. And I just felt that as an advisor, as someone who talks about money and, you know, I do presentations separately for women in particular and, and you know, about their finances, because we deal with so many unique issues that men typically don't deal with. Um, and I'm, I'm very proud that our company, the How Money Works company, uh, created this presentation so that we can continue this conversation. Um, now, first and foremost, this is a safe space. Um, I'm not encouraging anyone to share or open up, but that's totally your choice if you want to engage in some of this information through the chat or even at the end, um, you know, I always stop recording and keep talking with, with my participants. But I, I just wanted to publicly record this presentation and, and have it because I think it's something that, you know, it's kind of one of those things when it comes to money that we don't talk about. And I'm not here to be all sad and sappy about any of this. It's, it's again, it's just a real reality for um, what we deal with when with women, what they deal with when it comes to their finances. And, you know, when I in the registration for this webinar, I said, you know, and this is part of why we do the work that we do. Uh, before I hit record, my colleague Joanne, you know, talked about how great today is with the weather. But we are part of a collective um, organization of women leaders who are reaching out into our communities to talk about, you know, financial education and how do we make financial literacy more accessible to women, you know, because we don't want any woman to be left behind. We don't care what your situation is or what financials you do have. And so I truly believe that bringing awareness to domestic violence and financial abuse, that is a part of our outreach. We cannot not have this conversation. And we believe that, you know, when you improve financial literacy for all women, that it will open doors and it definitely, um, you know, open more, bring more opportunities for them. So just to start off with a couple of statistics, one in four women will experience domestic violence at some point in her life. And 99% of those victims will suffer from financial abuse. You know, abusers, they use financial control, they use isolation and intimidation to keep their victims trapped. And one thing I also want to clarify is that we're not here to say that the abusers are also necessarily men. You know, you could be or someone that you love could be in a relationship with another woman, who, you know, someone who identifies as a woman and experience these things as well. So it's really thinking about that one on one, you know, relationship that you might have someone where you have a partner, any type of partner who could be abusing someone. So when we look at you know, in fact, in details, when we think about how does, you know, finances relate to domestic violence, you know, financial obstacles and financial dependence are generally the primary reasons that many women stay in abusive relationships, especially if they have children. 
And financial abuse, you know, we'll talk a bit in more detail about this. It really generally falls into three categories, which is first having financial control. It's also sabotaging your employment or education pursuits. And then there's also economic exploitation. So I want to just start with talking about red flags for financial control. Does your partner deny or limit access to, you know, the money that you have? Are like, are you on a strict allowance? I think I see this a lot too in some situations, especially for uh, women who maybe they don't bring or provide financial support. Maybe they're a stay-at-home mom um, and they're given a strict set aside of money. Do you, do, does your partner deny access to information from you, like having your bank statements or just even their pay stubs? Like you don't know how much your partner makes. Or what about hiding money from you? Um, I have a story for this one. I actually worked with um, a client. I think I started working with them back in, I would say like 2016. It's been a while that they've been some clients. And typically, you know, as an advisor, it was me and one of my partners. We go to the person's home. We sit down with them across the kitchen table and, you know, sitting down with my client and his lovely wife. They had three children together. And we were in, in my meetings with my clients, the first things that I typically go through are, um, you know, getting all the details about their current finances, like what's your debt? How much income do we have? What accounts do you have? Any investments? You know, just a basic uh, a question of like, what is this? What do your finances look like? And I remember this so distinctly. The wife had excused herself because she had to go to the restroom. And as soon as she was out of earshot, the husband was like, I want to tell you guys, I have money here. I have a house there. I have this account set up here, but she doesn't know about it. So I don't need you. you know. So he basically told us about the money, but he was like, but I don't want you to tell her, but I'm telling you because you guys are the advisors. And I remember that moment like, wow, um, it was very awkward because as advisors, we have a fiduciary responsibility to our client to keep that information confident. And even though we were working with both the husband and wife, we legally couldn't even tell her that information that he shared with us. So was that a form of financial control? I think so, you know, because he was hiding assets from her that she had no clue about. And then uh, typically, you know, when I work with husband and wives, um, because often when they sit with me, it's really the first time they've actually talked about their finances together. And the to, and, and I'm, a, I'm an advisor where I'll challenge the husband and wife and say, well, you guys should be doing this together. You should be, you know, on the same page. But unfortunately, because she came back from the bathroom, I didn't even we didn't even have a chance to ask him why. Like, why were you keeping these assets separate? Why were you hiding it from her? Uh, I didn't know if it was just for a rainy day or just kind of if worst case scenario. So we, I didn't even get a really chance to even ask him about why was he doing that. But I see this constantly just in my private practice as an advisor. So here's what I was talking about a little earlier. Do they demand, again, a detailed accounting of how you spend your money? Do they criticize your financial decisions? Does your partner threaten to withhold money from you? Or, and then also, do they make financial decisions without consulting or considering you? I know, again, for me as an advisor, one thing that typically um, when I take on clients, especially if they're married, I probably would have been introduced to one person first. Maybe like the wife attended one of my financial education classes or vice versa. And typically it's the one spouse or the one partner who, in, who initially meets with me that I have a consultation with. And um, the two questions that I always ask is, okay, great, I see that you want financial help, but do you have a partner or a spouse? Yes or no question. They'll say, oh yes, I do, I'm married. And then I'll, my second question is, well, shouldn't we be engaging that partner or spouse? And again, some situations, they're like, no, I, I do all the decisions. They don't need to be involved. You could just work with me. And I'm like, okay, again, I like to challenge folks sometimes. I'm like, well, if I make financial suggestions and recommendations, don't you think they should know about it? Or um, do you get their input from it? And sometimes they'll say, yes, you know, they should. And I'm like, okay, well, they need to be at the table also. But then sometimes folks are like, no, they don't need to be a part of it. And uh, again, that's my choice to decide to work with someone who, um, who, who deals with that. But again, I see it, you know, where people don't even involve you know their their partners in these the financial you know 
consulting them or asking them about certain things. So when it comes to the employment and education sabotage, I really actually didn't think about this too much when I was reviewing the presentation earlier, but this can also, you know, this is also uh, considered financial abuse as well. You know, does your partner pressure you to miss work or be late or quit your job or your academic pursuits? Do they harass you at work or school? Imagine if someone is being harassed to where it would make it hard for them to maintain, you know, going to school or going to their job, or even if they harass your coworkers, your bosses or your school friends, that would make, that would put, you know, a woman in a very complicated situation to where she's like, well, you know, let me separate from my schooling or employment because of the things that, um, you know, the, the negative impact that those things are happening with her partner. What about, do they belittle your work or school accomplishments? Um, you know, how many people, you know, like for me, for example, I just earned my MBA last year and I couldn't imagine if my partner was like, oh, whatever, forget about your degree. And I'm like, what? I studied so hard for this. You know, I accomplished this big goal. But uh, when it's a financial abuse, some partners will do that. Do they criticize your career or academic choices and your goals? Or, you know, worst case, do they physically harm you? to prevent you from going to work or school because maybe you don't want to be, you know, bruised or physically, you know, uh, distressed because of that, that abuse that you might have experienced at home. And then lastly, when it comes to economic explo exploitation, does your partner, do they withdraw money from your bank accounts without you even knowing? You know, imagine them having access to your money and, and taking it out when you don't have access to it. Or what about them adding their name to your credit cards? Imagine what could that what could that do to your credit profile that you had nothing to do with? What about does your partner pay the mortgage, the rent, or the bills late? You know, a lot of the families that I work with um, typically have shared finances. And what if someone's not upholding their side of the agreement you know like for example the husband pays the mortgage and you pay your cable bills out whatever what if they don't like what if they just completely fail to pay the mortgage render bills at all that's financial abuse to you as their partner and again if they're on your credit cards they could run up a lot of debt in your name or they could take out a second mortgage a first or second mortgage on your home again because they're your partner you probably wouldn't be able to stop them from doing that and then obviously the big thing is that they could completely ruin your credit score which we know in this day and age how important it is to have a strong credit profile when you're seeking financial you know loans or support or resources and imagine someone taking advantage of you and exploiting you to where now you have to overcome just that barrier from someone else's um, ill intentions so you know as we talk about you know those you know obviously those are really bad things that can happen and the reality is that almost every aspect of leaving an abusive situation involves money it's like you need money to fill up the car with gas so that you can leave or you need money to buy a bus or a plane ticket you need money to find a new place to live and you need money just to put food on a table and if you don't have those resources it's extremely hard to leave so as we go through the rest of this presentation I just want you to think about you know what can you do if this is happening to you or to someone that you care about we have three so a couple steps that I'm going to um, review in these next couple slides that will really help you know you or again someone that you love who might be experiencing these things to help them protect their money and then also uh, really rebuild their financial future so the first one is to learn how money works. You know, we obviously are not taught basic financial pr principles in school. <laughs> you might receive one class on like how to balance a checkbook or, you know, just something very basic. You know, and sadly, as I mentioned, many women stay in abusive relationships because of money. And you really don't have to be a financial professional or an expert, you know, to learn how to become financially free. You don't need to be a financial professional to learn how to build a savings, to learn and, you know, about, about basic investment strategies or how to make your money grow. There's really many books and online resources that can help you get started. You know, we have master classes all, you know, all the time. We we teach what we call elements workshops. 
to where we help folks learn the basics about financial concepts. And we teach folks about how to apply the seven money milestones to your life. The seven money milestones are basically like, what are the seven areas of your personal finances that you should make sure to address? Um, and it's, we have a book that we use. It's called How Money Works, Stop Being a Sucker. I actually don't have one close by me um, here on my desk, um, but it's a free book that we use to give to folks so that they can learn the basics about money. And I promise anyone who has that book, if you read it from cover to cover, you will learn about finances more than 99% of the population. That's how much you will become educated. And that's the first step that we believe that women, especially in these abusive situations, they really need to take on learning how money works so that you're not necessarily depending on a partner for that information. So step two is to really be involved with your finances. You know, I know for myself, um, you know, I mentioned that in, in, when, in, early, in my early, you know, my teens, I was in a relationship that was um, abusive. And even as I got a little older, uh, two relationships after that, I experienced the same thing. And, you know, you're thinking like, why is this happening to me? Like, what am I doing? Am I reacting a certain way? And obviously I knew that what, whatever those situations were, it shouldn't re resolve to any type of abuse at all. Any type of, in my situation, it was a physical um, abuse. And even after I ended my last marriage, um, which experienced some of those things as well, I really understood and, and really in, in my mind, I said, no matter what, moving forward, I will take complete control and 100 responsibility for my finances. And, you know, luckily I have been doing this for quite a while. So even through my last couple of relationships, my last, uh, my last, my marriage in particular, I had already been in the financial services industry and really learning these concepts on my own, just, you know, becoming um, of training and becoming a financial advisor. Um, this company though, the How Money Works company through Wealthwave, I actually started working with this company though in particular about nine years ago. And the reason was because they they did outreach like this. <laughs> you know, they, 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 the conversations and the topics that we were able to share as an advisor were much more suited for people like me. You know, as a, as a young minority woman, as a single mother, as just the average American who's trying to make it through. And that's why I love working with this company. And I even, you know, greatly improved my finances because of the financial tools and resources that the things that I offer my clients, I do the exact same thing for myself. I rarely offer something that I myself has not have not implemented for my own finances. And so that's really what it means about being involved with your finances. That's what it means to know how money works. And then just, you know, now I built myself into being a leader in this organization, really building out my business. Um, also, always looking for partners to, to join me in, in having these conversations and being a how money works educator. And most importantly, serving my clients. And maybe you love your job and you're making great money, but I always, always, you know, pose this this option as well is just you know are you locked into that job for the rest of your career or or are you keeping your options open you know because if you keep your options open then i think you might like you know some of the things that we do here you know because the heart of our work is about giving people more control you know control of their income control of their time control of their career and what their future could look like here you know and now me um as i you know peruse this world and, and redevelop myself as this um, you know totally different woman from who i was as that you know 17 year old girl experiencing what i experienced i'm in complete control um you know and i i I manage my family, you know, because I have control of my time, my income, and really that true ownership and that true sense of freedom that I didn't have in my past relationships, but also in my past, you know, corporate jobs as well. So I always talk to women about this because some women just need that opportunity to earn more money to leave those type of situations you know so just think about what would your career or even a business or anything look like for you 
when you have complete control over it. You know, how many days a week would you work? What kind of income would you earn? Would it be the typical 60 hours a week or would you work, you know, fewer hours? I definitely don't work 60 hours a week. Um, so stay with me because I'm really about to show you a proven path that can really help you get past these realities. So we just gone through, you know, the common signs of financial abuse, and it usually doesn't happen all at once. You know, financial abuse, it, it typically is a gradual process, and it may even look like your abuser, again, man or female, man or woman, it even might look like they're trying to do you a favor at first, you know, so it's really important to recognize um, the red flags, you know, so that you can connect the dots. Because at the end of the day, the abuser's goal is to keep you trapped in that relationship. So many women, well, the fourth step, you know, again, to trying to get out of those situations is many women really, they want to stay quiet. You know, they don't want to let others know what they're going through. And that really, it typically, it probably will make things worse for them, not better, because women need to come together. We need to speak out and tell our stories and the steps that, you know, we took to regain our financial footing. Um, because you sharing your story and talking about these problems, that could be exactly what someone else, what can help someone else and or another woman who's, you know, dealing with this difficult time. Um, dealing with those exact same experiences and, and during that difficult time in her life. So I encourage women to always just have the conversation and, and you know, it, it takes a lot of courage to mention and stand up and say, that's me, I'm experiencing that. So almost every aspect of leaving an abusive situation, like I mentioned, involves money. And here in our fifth uh, step that we outlined, you really wanna put a personal financial safety plan in place because even after you leave you know that abusive relationship like we talked about earlier you know many victims carry the burden of bad credit you know maybe of a judgment lien bankruptcies or back taxes for years so this is why in addition to the escape plan is crucial to have an individual's financial safety plan in place that can really carry you at least six months, you know, to help pay for your bills, the rent, the food, or any other expenses. You know, I encourage folks or, you know, anyone in this situation, just try to start your own stash of cash, you know, open your own bank account, get your own credit card, run your credit report. Also, <clears throat> alert your creditors. You know, your abuser probably can't stop you from writing a letter to your creditors and letting them know that this is you know happening to you change your passwords you know on all of your accounts and then also super important to make sure that you make copies of important documents like you know birth certificates marriage certificates because you'll need those things especially if you end up you know having a divorce or you know needing to um, reopen new accounts you know you also want to make keep copies of bank statements and then also statements of any other shared assets so if you have access to that information, hopefully you're able to maintain copies of it. So <clears throat> as I kind of start winding down the presentation, this one's one of the quicker ones. Um, I just wanted you to remind, you know, remind folks, none of us is perfect and none of us have a perfect life. Um, the important thing is to learn to grow and to move forward. You know, if anyone looked at me, they would have never imagine that I dealt with what I dealt with and obviously I didn't even share the whole thing here but I think a lot of women face some of these situations and they think that it's just them they don't know that a great majority of women deal with you know the financial abuse and the control that can happen in those relationships so the last thing I just want to share, <clears throat> excuse me, before I wrap up, is that if you or someone you care about is in an abusive situation, um, here are some resources on the screen that you can contact for help, uh, where it's uh, the domesticshelters.org. You have the 1-800 number, 1-800-799-7233. That's the, oh, sorry. That is the domestic violence hotline. Uh, I encourage you to share that information with someone. You just never know when someone's ready to make that move. You definitely want to give them the opportunity 
to get out of that situation and to really step away. And then if you have, um, if you're wanting more information about some of these things that we talked about today, again, here are the resources, the, the links to the statistics and um, information that I shared a little bit earlier of some of the information that I had talked about um, on the other slides. So uh, that's really the last of our conversation here. Um, this is just information on our company again, which is Wealthway, the How Money Works company, um, who I'm grateful that they put together this information for me to share and to have this really important conversation. So I thank you all for joining me and you have a good night.